okay, well, I'm happy that you're all here, and thank you for inviting me through 3G. Um, and for those of you who don't know, 3G Philly is an organization that um, runs courses for grandchildren of Holocaust survivors to engage with each other and learn, hello, um, and learn to tell their grandparents' stories of survival um, because we are the, the living link to the stories that bring humanity to um, remembering the Holocaust. So I'm going to share today about my grandmother, um, Ida Benone Relis. She, um, she was my Nona. Nona is the Italian word for grandmother, so that's how I reference her as Nona. She was born in 1917 in Venice, Italy. And sometimes when I tell people that I have Italian heritage, their response is, well, aren't you Jewish? And I feel like, well, there's, there's Jews in Italy. And, but I feel like some, sometimes people don't, don't make that connection. So um, before World War II, there were about 40,000 Jews in Italy. And now I think there are approximately 28,000. And so Italy actually, um, I'm speaking to a history club, so you may know better than I do, but Italy, um, even though at the time their leader, Mussolini, was allies um, with Hitler, he was slower to, to take on some of the, and, and comply with some of the rules around um, persecuting people because of their religion. So Italy, um, many Jews in Italy were saved from the horrors of concentration camps because there was a lot of underground efforts to hide them. Um, there was a network of Catholic churches that helped to hide the Jews, and then from the little bits and pieces I know, I think families and um, people who just didn't believe in Hitler's mission. So before I tell you my Nona's story of survival, I'm just going to... Um, whoops, give a little sense of who she was as my Nona. So she was the most um, comforting, loving grandmother. And this is a picture. Um, she looks as happy as can be, genuinely full of joy, even though she's holding me there. And I'm clearly kind of like trying to wriggle out of this picture. But she was still happy to hold me. Um, and also in this picture, um, on the bottom left is my dad, um, Nathan Rellis, who you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, next to him is my older brother, Ben. In the front is my twin brother, Danny. Uh, next to him is my older sister, Tammy. And then on the right is my grandfather, my papa, uh, Rabbi Mayor Rellis. And uh, uh, when we were with Nona, we just felt like we were her world. We, we were, she lit up when she saw us. Um, and I grew up in Philadelphia. I was born in Wisconsin, but we moved to Philadelphia when I was two. And my Nona and Papa lived in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. So twice a year, we would go and visit them and stay at their house. And they had a lovely small home with a shaggy blue carpet in the family room. And we just had so much fun when we were at their home. And... Um, they, did, they didn't talk about their stories. As a child, I never knew much about their stories. I, I really only recently learned, but um, we just had the best time there. And they were always, they always had treats for us, and it was always treats that were a little stale, because they only bought things if they were on sale. So, you know, they had like this huge green Tupperware canister full of candy or cookies or mints, whatever was on sale. That was what we ate the whole, t the whole time we were there. That was our treats. And I always thought they were delicious. So here's my grandmother, my Nona. She's in her kitchen here um, cooking. You can kind of faintly see in the back there that shaggy blue carpet that I can feel doing cartwheels and walking around on. Um, looks like she's cooking some grilled cheese, maybe some pasta. Um, behind her on the wall, there's a picture of a woman um, blessing the Shabbat candles. And then tucked in there is, looks like maybe a picture of the Italian landscape. Um, and that was probably all the decor on her walls, what, what you see there. Um, and so 
I don't even know if I ever noticed that, but when I look at this picture, it stands out to me. Um, and so my Nona was a fabulous cook. She was always cooking really good food, artichokes, vegetable soup, um, sandwiches. She made homemade cheesecake. We all loved her food, and we all have memories of our favorite meals. Um, and in a little bit, I'm going to get to a story about what she said was her best meal and came from a very different experience than being in a loving, warm home. Um, so uh, before World War II, um, I'm going to go back now. And so my grandmother's family, they lived a very comfortable life in Venice. Um, her, her parents owned properties, her father owned a butcher shop, and they had a comfortable, they had a comfortable living. And so here's a picture of my grandmother at the butcher shop. Um, I think she's with her uncle. And then there's a paper, this is um, just paperwork from one of the properties that they owned. Um, and uh, I think some of those properties were taken away when, um, when the Nazis were coming in and um, they didn't want Jewish people to have those properties. But I think, uh, um, from what I understand, many Italian Jew stories are, are largely unknown. The details of how they survived, because they were in hiding, um, there's just not a lot, a lot known. Um, and the same is true for my Nona. I don't know a lot of the details of her survival story. Um, I just know little bits and pieces to provide a glimpse into who she was and, and where she came from and, and how she survived. So um, these are pictures taken in Italy before World War II started. Um, uh, the picture on the left is, in the middle is my Nona holding up what looks like some kind of baton. This must have been gym class. Um, so, you know, a happy teenager, just enjoying her life. And then on the right, um, there's um, a woman in a white dress next to her in a black bathing suit with two braids. That's my Nona. And on the other side of my Nona, kind of tucked in there, that was her mother, Alba. Um, and I'm not entirely certain who else is in this picture. I think some cousins, some siblings. Um, yeah. The fourth from the left, her brother. Um, Cesare? Yeah. If we go back to the slide before, we have the Mm-hmm. I can't, I'm not sure. Oh. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, one of the things that strikes me about that is I think when you think of the Holocaust as a whole, and the pictures you often see are of people who already look um, desolate, and the way you see them in the pictures, they look, I mean, they just look poor and stripped. Um, and so I think it's remarkable when you hear the individual stories that that's, that's not where they started. They came from lives just like our lives. Um, so my, my Nona and her family, they lived in Venice in the north of Italy, and they were comfortable, and uh, I think um, they, um, it was later in the war that Italy started um, sending Jews to concentration camps and deporting Jews. So when they got word that um, Nazis were coming in to find the Jews, they decided to go south, because I think in the south there were more um, Safeguards. There were U.S. forces and Allied forces who were um, supposedly creating a safer space where not as many Jews were being deported. So my uh, my Nona and her mom, um, her father had already passed away a few years earlier. My Nona and her mom and six siblings, um, they decided to go south, and and this is where. Uh, there's not a lot known about her story. So they were in Venice, and somehow they made their way to Rome. Um, on a train, that would be about an eight-hour trip. It's like 325 miles. And I don't know how they traveled. Um, they were trying to stay hidden. So 
I think my Nona had a fake passport. They had to hide their identity. So if they, they didn't want to be stopped or seen by anyone because if a police officer or a Nazi found them and knew they were Jewish, they might take them to a concentration camp. So they traveled, they hid. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure if they were in woods, if there were um, generous people along the way who hid them. Um, but that was the trip they made. And this, um, on the right, this is a picture of my Nona's mother, Alba. Um, so my great-grandmother. And she's sewing in this picture. And she taught my Nona and all her siblings how to sew. And when they were traveling and on this trip, um, they would sew runs in people's stockings to earn money so they could have pennies to get bits of food, I'm not sure. Um, but that was apparently how they made some money, was to sew runs. And uh, it's pretty remarkable to me when I see this, like my Alba, she taught all her children to sew, and then they depended on that to earn money. Um, I have three children of my own, and I'm lucky if they unload the dishwasher once a week. So it's really um, remarkable that this is how they lived. And they had very little, and it was wartime, and there was just very little to be had anywhere. So um, there was a time when they were um, on, this, on this trek, and they came upon a store. And they needed some food, and they had a few, few pennies, um, a little bit of money from um, their sewing. And the store was really barren, really empty, and they went in. They said, do you have any food? Uh, and the store owner said, I have, I have nothing. What, you know, I'm, there's nothing here for you. And my Nona looked up in the corner of the store, and on a shelf there was a huge can of uh, spaghetti, like maybe an Italian version of SpaghettiOs. And she said, what's, what's that can up there? And he said, you don't want that. That's, it's expired, actually. That's, that's not for, you know, I'm going to throw it away. And she said, well, we'll, we'll take it. Give us, a, give us a bargain. You know, we'll take it for a sale. And so they, they took the can of spaghetti, I don't know where they took it. I don't know how they opened it. I don't know how they ate it. Did they have forks? Did they have a table? Did they? I don't know. But my Nona said it was the best meal of her life. The best meal of her life. So when you're really starving, even expired canned spaghetti will taste delicious. And so um, that's just a little bit that I know. And there's, there's very little else known, but I know they survived. Um, my, my Nona and her mother and her siblings, um, they did it. They stayed hidden until after the war, and they survived. So this is after the war. This is my Nona. I think I'm told she's around 26 years old here, so um, she's back in Venice. Maybe that was on her wedding day. I'm not really sure. Um, but. As the story goes, she got back to Venice, and she was 26 years old. Um, and at that time, I think that was a little bit older to be not married, but of course it was after the war. And she ran into a man who had been the shochet at, um, at, at the school where she went, and he taught Hebrew studies. And he was um, also, a, also a survivor. And I guess he said, well, we're both, you know, we're, we both survived and we're close enough in age and let's get married. <laughs> and she said, okay, this is what my Uncle George tells me. Maybe, I don't know. They were nine years apart. He was much older. So um, they were two eligible survivors. And my Nona apparently was beloved by many. She had a lot of friends in Venice and she wanted a big wedding. And my grandfather was the only survivor in his family. He was actually from Poland, but he survived because he was studying in Italy. And so he said, I'm in mourning. My whole family's gone. I just want a small wedding. And they had a small wedding. Um, and they got, they got married in the Spanish synagogue in Venice in 19, 1946. She was 26 years old. And this paper here, um, I'm not sure if that's their wedding certificate or another property. No, that's, uh, that's something documenting that her father fought in World War I. Mm. Okay. 
Okay. I guess I have to have these documents interpreted. So my Nona and my Papa, they started a family. They had three children, uh, my father Nathan, the oldest, and his brothers George and David. So you can see here the picture on the left is uh, my Nona and Papa with my dad, their firstborn. Um, and then on the right is my Nona with my dad on the left and my Uncle George on the right. And the paper in the middle is um, the paper that shows they were on the list to get into the US. When my dad was five years old, there was an organization called HIAS that is still in operation today. Um, it's an organization that wants to protect refugees and welcome the strangers. So HIAS helped them get to America. And I think um, they were told they were coming for a job. Um, but really, it was just because HIAS knew they wanted to protect and get people to America. So. Um, and I think last night I was going through these, these slides and kind of practicing telling this story to my daughters and my 11 year old said, well, where's Uncle David? She had three sons. And I'm assuming uh, my Uncle David, the baby of the bo three boys, he would have been around nine months old when they were coming to America. So at that time, I guess they didn't have the time and it, it wasn't a priority to take a formal picture. So um, I'm assuming that's why there's not an updated picture with Uncle David before they left Italy. Um, they didn't have cell phones, so a picture must have been, you have to plan it and hire someone. And so, um, so my Nona embarked again on another trip. They took a boat to America. Um, another long trip, um, not as grueling as her journey of survival, but I'm sure scary and uncertain nonetheless to be going to a country where she didn't speak the language. Um, she had three babies with her, um, and so I, I'm, sh I'm sure it wasn't easy, and I, I wonder when she was on that trip, did she think about her, her trip with her family and, and her survival, and you know, she was leaving her whole family behind also. Um, and I, I just think what, you know, when she was traveling from Venice to Rome, and when she was on this cruise ship, what, what was she thinking? What was she, you know, her mornings, her nights? Um, she, she married a rabbi. Were they praying together? Um, what were they thinking? They, um, it, it could not have been easy. But they made it to America. Um, and here they are. Uncle David makes it into a picture. This is um, on the left a picture of my Nona and Papa with. Um, there are three sons. I think this was someone's bar mitzvah, maybe. Um, and so I think it took a long time for my Nona to acclimate to being in America. She was a rabbitzin, which is the rabbi's wife. And so um, she was, you know, the community loved her. She made food for, for everyone. Everyone knew her. Um, when they came here and my dad was five years old, he went to kindergarten and he kind of became the connection to the English language, so he taught them to speak English. And I guess um, his first day home from kindergarten, he came home and excited to tell them a word he learned. He said, mouse, because there's no TH sound in Italian, so. Um, so um, I think what um, I always found remarkable about my Nona, um, as I knew her, even before I knew some bits and pieces of her story of survival, is that she, um, she created a remarkable life for her family, for her children, with very little. Um, she, she just was very resourceful. She cooked, she cleaned, she fixed things. Um, and when she was finally somewhat acclimated to America, I think, uh, my, my dad was studying for one year in Germany, and he, my sister was born, the first grandchild, so my Nona and Papa went to Germany to visit, and then they made a stop in Italy, and my grandfather was offered a job as a rabbi at the synagogue where he had, I think, been a rabbi before they came to America. And by that point, my Nona didn't want to leave America. She had her three boys and a grandchild, but they went back to Italy for five years so my grandfather could be a rabbi in Italy again. And so on the right is uh, my Nona and Papa with my Uncle George in Italy when they went back for those five years. 
And then um, after those five years, they came back to um, Wisconsin, and they eventually retired in Santa Barbara, California, um, where they spent time enjoying the beautiful weather. And uh, when my grandfather passed away, uh, my Nona came to live in Philadelphia at the Abramson Center for Jewish Living, and this is where she spent her final years. And she got to meet five of her 13 great-grandchildren before she passed away. And these pictures, um, the top left, again, my Nona so happy with her grandchildren. Um, that's my brother Ben and my sister Tammy. Um, the bottom left, that's me with my Nona. Um, I love that picture because I take pride that I got her hair and I look a little bit like her. Um, the top right is my Nona with my Uncle George's dogs. Um, in the middle, that's my mom and my dad surrounded by their 12 grandchildren. Um, and the bottom right is um, the 13th grandchild, my Uncle David's grandson. Um, and I think these are the answers to her prayers. And that's her story. Thank you. Okay. And I'm happy to take questions. My dad is here to share some more details about my grandfather's story, which is much different. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I, I think it was because they, they wanted the promise of a better life. I think that, it, you know, it was after the war, but um, I don't think there was a lot um, I don't think life was, was lovely for, for them in Italy. Um, and I think when my, I think my grandfather wanted to get to America for the promise of good education and a better life, right? Yeah. 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 Um, Yugoslavia is way, way up north on the other side of the, the, the right. And uh, they were occasionally fighting with each other. Yugoslavia and Northern Italy. Oh, yeah. So a picture of like Russian Ukraine but on a smaller scale. Because they basically wanted the land. And so my father got very uncomfortable. Mm. And he was afraid the war would break out because he said people thought it was unstable and he didn't want to have any more war. And, and, and you know, as Sarah said, they were looking for the Iraq and the United States. So for my father's entire life, he always said to him, People thought it. Why do you worry about people thought it? People thought it was a stable country. Nothing's going to happen in Yugoslavia. Of course, shortly after he died, that's, that's when the enemy is really got bad. But I think at, at, a, at a time of after the war, people, people don't know what's going to happen there. They don't have the kind of stability. They often don't have the family. And that's, you know, that's what leads to immigration. People wanting a better opportunity. Probably not that like
Oh. That's okay. You would have maybe 50 to 75 more people in here right now. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Okay. Oh, thank you. We have a lot. Yeah. Yes. No, but they went to Germany first. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if someone would experience that privation of power and second yeah. or what it felt like to be on German territory, even long after the fact. Yeah, right? yeah. Do, do, do you have an audience that? I, I doubt it. I think it's an excellent question. Um, I think I think my dad could answer that better. And maybe come up here so, that, cause the, wow. so you're on the recording and mic'd. Okay. Here, yeah, come up so you can. The same question for you, because you were in Italy as a. Well, I think the question is, what's it like for, for a Jewish person going back to Germany? Right. So. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you two stories. The first is that when I told my parents that I would be going to Germany, they didn't have a problem with it, and my dad said to me, "You will see." that the Germans will treat you with so much love, they won't be able to do enough for you. They're going, what, you know, they're going to greet you with open arms. Obviously, because he felt that the Germans who remained would have a great deal of guilt and a feeling towards Jews where they would, and I found that to be true, in fact. The other thing is that when we went there, this is a terrible thing that we did, <coughs> my, um, my wife was, pregnant with our first child, and we went there, didn't know much about what was going on there. We didn't even have a phone because the phone system was pretty antiquated. We had to go into town to use a pay phone. A pay phone was something where you put coins in it. <clears throat> so we got there, and because we were very busy setting up and finding a place to live, and I had to start work, um, we, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to call my parents and let them know where we were. So after two weeks, in the middle of the night, we heard our doorbell ringing. We were up on like the 10th floor of an apartment uh, building, housing complex, and the doorbell rang. And the do doorbell was like, Mah! like at 2 o'clock in the morning. Mah! Who could that possibly be? I looked out the window and I saw two German police cars. Now, I, I really, I didn't have a fear for, for Germans. I spoke German. I learned German in school because it's popular where I grew up. And I didn't know what to expect. I didn't answer the door. In the morning, we got up, and there was a note in the door saying we should go to the main city, Offenbach, to report there or something. My father, because he hadn't heard from us in two weeks, <laughs> he called the police in the nearby town to have them come out and find. He knew our address somehow. I guess he got our mail. And so even though he had great faith in the German people, um, he did call them. Um, but it's something that's very much on my mind because one of the things that I'm uh, curious to see in, you know, in our lifetimes is uh, around the issue of reparations and how, you know, how well, frankly, how we as a country will deal with the issue of reparations, because as a Jewish person, I know what Germany ended up uh, uh, doing, and it's, you know, it's an interesting context. Uh, but when, when they came to visit us in Germany, they, they weren't uncomfortable.
was a rabbi in Venice, right? Um, what was his side of the story? Because he was also a survivor. He has a very, he has a very uh, different story from most survivors. He felt that he owed his life to the Italian people. And he even wrote a little monograph, a short book about his experiences. He went to Italy in the early to mid 1930s. He was from Poland. Where, actually, where he was from is now Ukraine. That area is, you know, today it's Poland, tomorrow it's Ukraine, then it's Russia, and then it's back to Poland, Ukraine. You know, it just goes back and forth. Any history student will tell you, you know, you, anyway. So um, he went to study in Italy to get a degree there because he grew up in Poland and he, he actually, he didn't speak Poland, Polish until he was 18. He spoke Yiddish because the Jewish people there spoke Yiddish. So, I mean, he learned Polish, he learned it quickly. My father spoke nine languages. He was very quick to learn languages. He went to Italy to get um, uh, a degree there at Padua University. And the, uh, the Jews in Italy, as Sarah said, were mostly safe because although Italy had, now I'm telling you his side of the story because he, he wrote this and he was, he was very upset in the 50s when what happened, there was a lot, of, you know, there was a lot in the news about um, Italian gangsters and the mafia and he didn't like people denigrating the Italians because he said the Italians did so much to save Jews during the Second World War and he wrote this whole story. So uh, for a while he was protected by the Italian government and then in, uh, when Italy joined the alliance with Germany for a long time, as Sarah said, they didn't deport Jews but they did have concentration camps. They were not extermination camps. Think of them more as like internment camps, like what the United States had for Asians during World War II, where they kept the Jews within a camp, but they had relative freedom, or my, my dad exaggerated and said they were like resorts. Well, you know, if you grew up in Poland and were poor and had nothing, it would be like a resort. Um, but then he was put into a concentration camp and they weren't allowed to leave, and then some people helped him to escape. But even before that, when they changed the laws, first Italy enacted what were called the racial laws that said that Jews could not own property, they couldn't do a number of things. And um, when they started to deport them from the country, they said that foreigners could stay. I, I don't understand the logic of that, but they did. And then when it became even more strict, they said, okay, foreigners can't stay, but if foreigners are attending a school, if they're in a, uh, in a school, in a university, they can stay. My father was in a university but was about to graduate. And he claims that when he had to uh, come to the point where he had to defend his dissertation for his doctorate, he took the exam and he knew it all. He, he was really very good. He also majored in philosophy, history, and classics or something like that. And when it came time for him to defend his dissertation, he defended it, everything was fine, and the professors looked at each other and one of them said, I, I, think, I think you have to stay here and study some more so that he would be exempt from deportation. And that was just one example he gave of how he felt the Italians were among the unsung heroes of the Holocaust, having uh, saved countless n uh, numbers of, of Jews. Yes. I'm sorry, they what? They, um, they didn't no, no, they were completely eliminated. If you saw, um, if you look, at, if you think back to the picture that Sarah showed of uh, my family, me, 
my wife, our four kids, our 12 <laughs> grandchildren. You know, you get some sense that there were, there were families like that in Europe. You know, you see pictures of them. And it's a, you know, it, it gives it a certain perspective. My father lost his entire family. No, he, two nieces survived. One is still alive in Los Angeles. She's 105 years old. But he lost his entire family. Never talked about it, never said anything about it. As Sarah said, they, they never, I think that's one of the um, unusual things. There are some Holocaust survivors who today do talk about what happened to them. I mean, and the ones who are still living were, were very young at the time. But for the most part, Holocaust survivors didn't talk a lot about what happened and how they survived. There are a number of reasons for that and countless books that have been written about it. But um, yeah, my father lost his entire family. And then think about what Sarah said that shortly after that, my mother had to leave her entire family to come to the United States. She didn't speak a word of English and still didn't for many years after. But you know, that's, um, that's part of the story of immigration that we sort of take for granted. We see immigrants coming across the border and immigration is a problem in our, in our country, but you don't think about what they had to go through and what was on their minds as they made the travel. I do want to make one correction about something that Sarah said. She mentioned how we came over on a cruise ship. It wasn't quite a cruise ship. Oh, oh, oh yes, it was, it, was, it was a boat. And I recently learned that it was a, um, uh, it was a, a U.S. naval vessel that had been put out of commission that was that was used to transport um, to transport immigrants over. Two weeks on a boat. <laughs> it wasn't the love boat, <laughs> but it was. Uh, yeah, I don't remember any of it. I vaguely, my brothers and I, one of my brothers and I vaguely remember, we think, seeing the Statue of Liberty as we came into the harbor, but we don't know if we really saw it or if it's because we saw it in a movie somewhere, but that's, <clears throat> that's, that's where we came in. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you said they lived in Wisconsin for a while. Yeah. What made you feel about that? You know, it's an, it's an interesting, well, the first place they came to you know where immigrants usually go when they arrive in a country? Yeah, but, but once, they, yeah, once they get there, where, where do immigrants end up? I'll tell you where they all end up. They end up where there are people who they already know, possibly family members or people they knew. And as it turned out, um, after my parents were here for a while, they connected with some people in Chicago who had immigrated earlier from Italy. Who they, who they knew. So my father actually settled in the Chicago area and he taught there for a little while. And then a job came up, an offer came up in northern Wisconsin for a rabbi and he took it and ended up in beautiful, freezing, superior Wisconsin. Very cold. Near sort of where Green Bay is. People in this country aren't quite sure where all those things are, but. Uh, northern, northern Wisconsin. And the other thing that attracted Jews to Wisconsin um, were uh, Wisconsin's very much a farming state, farming community, and a lot of the Jewish immigrants who came here were farmers. Farmers and scrap dealers. They settled in Wisconsin. Oh, and I wanted to also mention uh, an organization that Sarah mentioned that you should know about historically and having a lot to do with immigration. Um, and that's the organization that brought us here or helped to get us here. And that's an organization called HIAS, H-I-A-S. It stands for Hebrew Immigration Assistance Society. And it was to assist uh, Hebrew immigrants because at the time, a lot of people referred to Jewish people as Hebrews. And that organization today is, it's still called the Hebrew Immigration Assistance Society, 
but they're, they're very active and vocal in matters pertaining to all immigration and all immigrants. Yes? Um, this is a bit of a complicated question, but uh, as time goes on, we have less and less people who uh, survive the Holocaust around. Um, and you're the son and the granddaughter of people who lived through it. Uh, do you see many other children of Holocaust survivors going and giving talks? Because I feel it's very important and also, you know, I see it being, might be dangerous in the future when these people are no longer around. Well, less and less. So we're depending very heavily on uh, people in the field of uh, uh, history education. <laughs> but, I, but I will say the, uh, the organization that I uh, that really uh, was the first time I started kind of digging a little for more information about the grandmother story is 3G, third generation, uh, 3G NY. It started in New York, but now there are chapters all over, so there's a 3G Philly. Uh, and that organization, all their whole purpose is to help grandchildren learn to tell their grandparents' story. And so when I did that class uh, last spring, it was four weeks, uh, once a week for two hours, and it was a Zoom call with all grandchildren who want to learn to tell their grandparents' story. Uh, and it was one of the most emotional experiences because I'm logging and I'm looking at the Zoom screen and I'm thinking, like, here we are. Like, all these other, I had never met these people before. Uh, and um, we all shared our stories, and the leader of the course helped us. They wanted to be a story that brings humanity. And so that's why so much of the story I shared about um, who, who my daughter was as a person and the moments I know. And so that is an organization that really is trying to, uh, to keep the stories alive and uh, by making sure grandchildren know how to tell their story. And there were
Well, I, one thing I would add is um, I, I've, I've always been sensitive to it uh, and aware of it. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I visited my uh, son and grandchildren in um, California, just outside of Los Angeles. We live in a small community called El Segundo, which is a very, um, what's, what's the term I'm looking for, a mixed community, all nationalities and whatnot. And <clears throat> um, a few days before I had gotten there, uh, someone had painted a swastika on the street in front of their house. Now, <laughs> they're, they're practically the only Jewish people in El Segundo. But, uh, you know, friends of my grandchildren, who are also 15, uh, know that they're Jewish, and that's what they did. The ring doorbell got a picture of uh, some of them, and so my son went and talked to their parents. Uh, most of the parents were apologetic and, and so on, but it, it you know, it's, um, it's, it goes on. It, you know, it's a, it's a concern. But to me, I, 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 I'm certainly upset about um, anti-Semitism and sensitive to the fact that uh, these things are done against Jewish people. But I am, I am equally and, and, and sometimes even more upset with how it's a manifestation of those attitudes towards all nationalities uh, and races. As an, as an immigrant, you know, you hear me talk a lot about immigrants and immigration. Well, <clears throat> it's on, I, you know, it's only a short time that I've looked at my life or looked back and thought of myself as a refugee. That's, that's what I was. Uh, and I'm, you know, nationalized, very uh, grateful American citizen, but I'm very sensitive to issues surrounding immigrants and all uh, persecuted communities and, and minorities. It, uh, it upsets me because I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm one of them. them. And talks like this always end by saying the future is in your hands. Thank you.